I recently published this, this blog post. It's called What Color Is Your Off? And the name is alluding to this other, other blog post that's, that says, that's called What Color Is Your Function? You, you may know it. And um, so the author is kind of longish, but if you get down, uh, down three quarters of the way, uh, you get the idea that the author is saying there's red for async functions and I think um, blue for, for sync. Uh, in programs in general, and he's trying to make the point that um, you know you should, you should it's sort of the, the type of function that you use to make up your program kind of dictates everything else about your your architecture. So I mean, I, I used it as a kind of hook to talk about uh, a pattern, which you could kind of see as another type of function. And uh, the pattern that that I'm talking about in in this blog post is the the durable workflow pattern. And um, the, the, the blog post itself is, is about authentication. But as I told you uh, earlier, um, I'm more interested in sort of the pattern behind it than the actual uh, application to, uh, to auth. So I might just give you a demo to, so you can see it working. And because um, I think it, it's, it's quite quick. And then maybe maybe after that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what the durable workflow pattern is and how would you what I'm going to show you right now, you, you could solve with a database, and then you could uh, solve with this uh, with what I'm using here, which is temporal. And I'm making kind of this is again more for like readability or as a hook, but I'm saying, hey, this is almost like another color. Let's call this a green uh, function color, you know. So maybe durable workflows are like not quite sync functions, not quite not quite async. But they're kind of something else, and they serve a purpose. And like in the other article, it kind of dictates the way you put it, your application together. So um, I'll paste the link to the, the article later. But but first, let's let's jump in and see if we can make this this work. So I'm I'm going to um, you should see my terminal now. I'm going to start the temporal server, and I'll explain a little bit later what it what its role is here. Um, so I'm um, I'm running a ser both a a server here, which is temporarily is acting as a as a broker to sort of control long running work durable workloads in my application. So um, and, and it also has a, a a UI that will kind of show show the pr what's running and where it's running and so on. We're we're gonna load that up and. Um, Let's load up the, the UI right now so you, you can see it. Um, so this is a temporal uh, UI and it shows you kind of what durable workloads you're running on your machine. I'm not running anything right now. There's also schedules and some other things that we're not gonna use uh, right now. You can kind of nicely work as a, uh, in, a in a scheduler role uh, as well. And um, okay, so to actually do stuff, I'm gonna start up my, uh, my application. Uh, this is a BIF application. Um, it's been a handy framework for me to kind of get into closure. It's neither like too um, specific nor so generic that it's hard to understand. It's been a kind of nice middle and kind of manageable level. Uh, for me, so I, I think I still can get plenty of mileage uh, out of it. So I'm, I'm planning on using it for this project I'm, I'm telling you about. So the, I started the application, it's connected to Temporal, to the, to the server, and it starts up a worker. So as part of the application boot, it'll start up a worker and, and it'll register some functions. And, uh, and the, it'll, there's a dev workflow macro I'll show you in a second that is registered. So Temporal kind of gets into uh, in your code every workflow and activity. Um, that's Temporal speak for executable stuff. It'll register them with, and, and then you can kind of execute them either on demand or on a, or on a schedule. So what is it that we're uh, running today? Let me very quickly go to the code. And oh, I think I might actually have to make a small, <laughs> small change here and remove, blow up the database. Um, um, 
and let's restart the application again. So diff uses xdv v1, and it's just files on, on disk. So I'm going to connect. Uh, I just uh, connected to my application and let's load some, I loaded a, a test user and the application itself is simple. It is it's to do with uh, authentication with Google. We're not gonna really talk very much about authentication, but it's serving the role here of a long running workflow that, so something that takes at least two steps to, to uh, complete. Right, so we're going to start the authentic uh, an authentication workflow. Then we're going to go see it running in, in that uh, temporal UI. Go to, then we'll go to Google, finish the authentication, come back to the application. And uh, then we're going to look at the contents of a Google Sheet that's been pre-configured. So let, I'm going to start, start this and then try and go back to the, so in the, in the temporal UI, I think I have two tabs open right now, but it says there's a workflow running. And um, just kind of keep that, in, keep that in mind. This is the sort of durable, long running workflow thing. And then I'm going to log in with Google. Uh, okay, another little uh, a catch here. I'm, I'm actually gonna do this from Chrome because I'm not logged into Google here. <laughs> so apologies. Uh, let's, let's do that twice. You're gonna, you're gonna see one workflow is gonna time out and the other one we're actually gonna complete. So I, I just started, I'm gonna click on and authenticate with Google. So in the, in the incognito mode, I'm not obviously authenticated with Google. So I, I should have just logged into that first. So, I mean, this is all that, that we're doing here. We're, we're showing the contents of a, a Google, Google sheet. And uh, so we've run this kind of two-step authentication workflow. And that is durable because it's as the, that request is in flight, we're storing some, some stuff. Now we're, we're not, we could store that in a, in a database. The normal way to do this would be just create a couple of database models and um, maybe something called like a auth request so that when you start it, you create an auth request or and another one called an auth so that when you finish it, you create that other one. Or you could just do one and sort of update in phase. You have to, be creative about how you kind of keep track of this two-step process. As, um, as a user, we've left the site completely. We've come back, but we may, maybe we'll come back. Maybe we'll never come back. Maybe we'll come back with a, a access token. Maybe we won't. Maybe, um, and then maybe our application is running on two separate machines behind a load balancer. So if we're doing this two-step thing, like uh, we, we better be persisting uh, some, some work in progress kind of state as, as we go on. Um, but anyway, the gist of it, as far as like what a durable workflow is, um, so for, for me, Temporal is in this kind of small scale, it's, it's helpful because I, it lets me kind of treat this process as a unit and observe it as a single, as a single um, kind of unit of work. So the, here in the UI, we have a timeline this timeline started, it's, it's saying I took nine seconds to sort of hit that button, button and leave. And then at, at one point somewhere here, a few seconds later, there was a callback. Then we did a code exchange. And after that, we persisted the, the authentication. And uh, there's a, below, below the timeline, I have an event, event history, which is, sort of how the tool internally keeps track of the, the steps that, that were done. So each start and end of these, these kind of sections would roughly correlate to an, an event. And I have some, a, new, a UI where I can see data coming in and out. Now I, I, I can't quite see the, uh, the contents here because this is nippy encoded, base64 base encoded, um, but there's a uh, temporal, there's a codec server I'll show you the, the code for the, behind this, the closure code in, in, in a second as well. But um, let, me, let me finish kind of with the UI first. Uh, so there's a codec server. Um, 
I can only do one thing at a time. Yeah, AD, ADAD codec. I think that's right. So is it a codec server that will the, allow the browser to make a cross-origin request and decode this stuff for me, right? So even though the browser itself doesn't, doesn't know how to display this information, it, uh, it will send the request to the server. You can, here you can see all the decode requests for every, every input and output of every little step of the, the workflow and uh, in that little timeline. So, uh, so it's kind of pretty easy to debug. And uh, if stuff fails, the UI has like retries, which are kind of handy. And um, so, so for my, the use case I'm, I'm working on, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be using this for ETL, which is, so as a data group, uh, you know, ETL tools are there, are, there are many out there. And, but this is a pretty good one for ETL because it, I don't, it handles kind of all this intermediate state, it gives me a good observe, observability into what's going on. And these workflows can run for nine seconds, they can run for hours. So if I have a long running ETL job that maybe takes an hour to, to complete, and that maybe I, where maybe I have like, um, I wanna be able to, pick that up in a different machine or, you know, it shouldn't be, if I'm, if I have, I have a data loading task that, that takes one hour and uh, 45 min uh, minutes in, I fail, uh, my program fails, I should be able to just start up the process again and pick up at that point and finish instead of having to uh, do the whole thing again. So I don't know how many times uh, you guys have coded stuff like that, but I have, and it's never fun, right? Because then you have to introduce database models that are kind of dumb, right? Like current page. And I don't know, do I really want to be worrying about coding that stuff? And instead, I would rather be coding uh, some functions and then using a few conventions. Um, so the function that, we're, that, that we just ran is, uh, is this one, it's a, Define using a dev workflow uh, macro. This is a really nice library that somebody in the closure committee uh, made. It's not an official library, but uses the Java official uh, temporal library under on, under the hood. And um, so this is this is a kind of thing that I want to be writing both for authentication, but also for for ETL. You know, it's a function that I just run once and. Um, you can kind of read top to bottom, right? So the workflow has a state atom. This is the state atom kind of uh, stands in place of uh, the database models that, that I would usually use in a more conventional approach. And then uh, we have some signals, right? So we go back to the UI, there's here, it says signal received and the, the signal was a callback, callback signal. Um, so it, it was handled by this signal handler and um, one process can start the workflow and another one can finish it if it uh, receives a signal. The, the rule is that there can only be one workflow with one, a, a single ID that's running at any given time. So uh, I arranged it so that when I click the button, I started a workflow with a certain ID, then I kind of put it in a uh, waiting state here because it's waiting for an access token. Um, so when we, when we looked at that, the first time I showed you the, the UI and, uh, and it said there was a running workflow, it was, it was here at line 100. So it's kind of blocked or parked here with a, the difference that I can, I can have hundreds or thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of uh, workflows that are blocked at the, at the same time because it's, it's, not, it's not really tying up a, a thread. So that, Again, this is, it logic, logically looks like a function, um, but it's, I don't know why my screen is jumping like that, but it's not, um, it has these kind of nice little uh, uh, kind of properties that, that make it sort of friendly uh, for running in, across many machines. 
and that's in, in our example a web app of a web application that's that's good even even for some a simple example like this um, in a more complex example you know you can imagine you can have a just many many processes going on at the same time and then the the portal is then going to act as a kind of orchestrator to make sure that to, to kind of uh, schedule some tasks in different different machines. Um, so how does how does this work? Uh, you can read up later, but there are activities that the whole it, the system works. I don't know why this is doing that, but there are um, activities that that should get that are um, side the side effects and communication with the outside world has to be in, encapsulated in these activity functions. And these won't only get run once. And that's how, it, so if two machines run my workflow, if one machine restarts a workflow that's been previously run up to a point, it'll just pick up che like checkpointed results of activities. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that it'll sort of catch up to where it needs to be and then just do the rest so that's how like many processes can can uh, cooperate on one overall function, you know, one overall work big workflow. So that's it. Um, I'm 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 not sure. I hope that it was kind of clear. If if you want to see more, there's that blog post here that I'll link. And oh, I just closed. So this is this is what what I'm going to do with it next. Um, my uh, customer has a, an on-prem. And wants to run this on prem, um, and fine. So we're going to, we're going to run a, a single JVM with the application and an XTDB um, that acts as an XTDB node with XTDB v2. Somehow, maybe in the very first POC, we're just going to use a file system. And so, and this the data loading is. It's a socially uh, listening application, so we're going to be using for the very first version a single API, sort of pulling data from the API in uh, periodically and loading up a database. It's quite simple, but the nice thing about the, that I I think we'll get with Temporal in, in part is just UI and uh, observability. So by having sort of remote control over, so by having Temporal tell our application to go and fetch something and then or refetch it if it failed and then save it to the database and sort of control that remotely. It's gonna it's going to, even if this is running in a data center that we don't control, and um, then we 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 can have quite a, a good view and, and and even some some control over what's going on by having these pieces kind of outside. Of the of the data center itself, a sort of like a, administrative like interface. Obviously, so we we are going to have a, a prod REPL and all that. That that I think is I'm excited about. <laughs> that um, and that's about it. That's uh, so durable workflows. Anything that takes a while to finish and where you are sort of um, saving your progress. I would say that's like the third like function color. It's neat that with something like Temporal, you can write it as a function. And um, instead of having many different database models and many different functions and having to call them at the right time. Um, yeah, plus UI and observability. Without having to instrument all of the code, I can kind of see what's, what's been run. Like I, I will instrument additionally, but there's we have those features too. And pricing is usage-based, so that's that's... That's quite good, uh, fairly startup friendly as, as well. So yeah, recommend kind of checking it out, taking a look, and uh, yeah, sh uh, should be a question if, if if you have or if you know anybody running a kind of ETL jobs with closure, would love to compare notes and see what they're doing. And um, yeah, that's me for today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, thank you, Kyle, for, you know, keeping us updated with this, this journey, right? Because you, you are sharing your plans with us and then you're bringing the updates following those plans. And that's so inspiring. Yeah. And one reason we are interested in temporal in the data context is that 
As far as I understand, it can be a tool for machine learning pipelines and for training machine learning models. And maybe one day we can explore that. Uh, does anybody yeah. have any questions to Carl? Any comments about what we've seen? Is it, is it okay, to, Kyle, to ask a little more about what might be missing in the current experience? What, what is actually maybe not so comfortable? Mm -hmm. this way? So, yeah, yeah it's um, one thing that's not, not very comfortable is, so Clojure has long stack traces. And um, so that, because if you're having something that's retrying code for you and it will do a lot of retries very fast, and, uh, and actually running every function, it, it doesn't tell you when it's rerunning something, but it will just rerun it. Uh, so that, that, that means like your terminal is, is, is impossible, becomes impossible as a, and, and you better have that UI. So a UI is not just a nice thing to have, it's kind of necessary um, because you lose self uh, visibility in, in sort of um, just your logs. So that's one thing. And then also, the, so Temporal likes storing all of the, even when there's an exception, the Temporal wants to store the stack trace and sometimes it overflows. And uh, so I'm having like exceptions. I can't see what happened because it just tells me like that was too long. <laughs> so I'm sure that maybe doesn't happen with other languages, but it, it happens with, with Clojure. Um, and then the, the, the other thing is because these, the workflows are, are like uh, long running there. You have to think carefully about how to, how to up, update them. So it's like a kind of clumsy versioning scheme that I'm not sure I quite understand for, for updating. If you break the rules on sort of, if you do something like access a database and you do that in your workflow function and not in one of these activity functions, I, no, nothing will like your code or it's not like a compiler fail, is it, there's no error anywhere it'll just do weird things you know so and that's kind of unsettling you know it, it, the the result might be just um, indeterminate who knows what's going to happen if you do that so uh, even even things like generating a random number things like uh, system time you you have to I mean, there's like a big, there's a, uh, a con cognitive like load on just understanding, you know, things that you would just you do easily become maybe a little scary because you might, um, you know, you might not just not be able to debug very, very easily. So if there's, I think it takes that the learning curve is there and the learning curve of, of like closure plus a learning curve of this is, is, is definitely uh, significant, you know? So it better be worth it. Like the stuff that it's getting you, it be, better be worth it for you or, or, um, or it's just going to be maybe a step back versus just using a database or something that you can more easily uh, debug in, in production. So I'm, I'm still, I think I'm pretty determined to kind of go through with it, but it does take a little bit of thinking, you know? Is this something that you really want? <laughs> yeah yeah that's very helpful this uh, honest addition mm -hmm. yeah any any other thoughts or comments by anybody uh i just wanted to interject that i appreciate the use of patterns in explaining the architecture i feel like the current uh rise of functional programming um, has created a backlash against OO stuff that has thrown mm -hmm. patterns under the bus too. And I'm like, no, no, mm -hmm. patterns are good. Yeah. Functional patterns are different in some cases and some of the OO patterns are degenerate in, 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 in the context of functional programming, but that doesn't mean that the use of patterns is not very mm -hmm. helpful for like communicating. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to cool. compliment you on the name of your blog. Uh, Oh it's yeah, it's very cool the, how you did the double entendre with the short form of your name that also reads as que pasa. Uh, yeah, that, that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. 